The Stargate Project The Stargate Project was a secret United States Army unit that established in 1978 at Fort Meade, Maryland by the Defense Intelligence Agency and the SRI International, a California contractor, to investigate the potential for psychic phenomena in military and domestic intelligence applications. The project and its precursors and sister projects originally went by various code names Gondola Wish, Stargate, Grill Flame, Center Lane, Project CF, Sunstreak, and Scangate until 1991 when they were all consolidated and rechristened as Stargate Project. Stargate Project's work primarily involving remote viewing was the purported ability to psychically see events, sites, or information from a great distance. The project was overseen until 1987 by Lieutenant Frederick Holmes, or Skip Atwater, an aide and psychic headhunter to Major General Albert Stubblebein and later president of the Monroe Institute. The unit was small-scale, comprising about 15 to 20 individuals, and was run out of an old, leaky wooden barracks. The Stargate project was terminated and declassified in 1995 after a CIA report concluded that it was never useful in any intelligence operation. Information provided by the program was vague, and included irrelevant and erroneous data, and there were suspicions of interjudge reliability. The program was featured in the 2004 book and 2009 film, both titled The Men Who Stare at Goats, although neither mentions the operation by name. During the tense period of the Cold War, the U.S. government sought to deploy a potent new weapon against the Soviet Union. Mind reading. In a highly classified project, conducted first in a California research lab in the 1970s, and later at an army base in Maryland, the CIA, Army, and Defense Intelligence Agency, or DIA, recruited men and women claiming to have powers of extrasensory perception, or ESP, to help uncover military and domestic intelligence secrets. In 2017, the CIA declassified some 12 million pages of records revealing previously unknown details about this program, which would eventually become known as Project Stargate. By the time the program was shut down in 1995, psychics known as remote viewers had taken part in a wide array of operations, from locating hostages kidnapped by Islamic terrorist groups to tracing the paths of fugitive criminals within the United States. The roots of Project Stargate go back to 1972, when a classified report made waves within the United States military and intelligence communities by claiming that the Soviet Union was pouring money into research involving ESP and psychokinesis, the ability to move objects with the mind for espionage purposes. In response, the CIA began funding its own top-secret research, headquartered at the Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park, California. In the early years of 1970, ex-Israeli paratrooper Yuri Geller, who became famous for his ability to bend forks and spoons with his mind, was invited to be a part of the research team at SRI. Though Geller was best known for his alleged ability to bend metal cutlery with his mind, the CIA was much more interested in another of his professed skills, his ability to read other people's minds and even possibly control them from his own. As Annie Jacobson writes in her book, Phenomena, The Secret History of the United States Government Investigations into Extrasensory Perception and Psychokinesis, 
The declassified documents show that CIA analysts wanted to probe Geller's abilities in the area of mind projection and its possible use for national security purposes. According to Ms. Jacobson, Geller played a key role in setting into motion the U.S. government's investigation into ESP and psychokinesis. In the winter of 1975, she writes, Geller even took part in a series of classified psychokinesis tests at a lab in Livermore, California, where scientists were developing advanced nuclear warheads, laser systems, and other emerging technologies. The CIA shut down its work with ESP in the late 1970s, and the program moved to the U.S. Army's Fort Meade, in Maryland, where it was funded by the Defense Intelligence Agency. Over the better part of the next two decades, Congress continued to approve funds for the remote viewing program. It seems to me a hell of a cheap radar system, says Representative Charlie Rose of North Carolina, as he was speaking to the House Select Committee on Intelligence during a meeting about psychic research in 1979. Quote, And if the Russians have it, and we don't, we're in serious trouble. Army veteran Joseph McMongle stood out among the remote viewers who worked with the government's top-secret program. As he later told the Washington Post, McMongle was involved in some 450 missions between 1978 to 1984 including helping the Army locate hostages in Iran and pointing CIA agents to the shortwave radio concealed in the pocket calculator of a suspected KGB agent captured in South Africa. Another remote viewer, Angela Delaforia Ford, was asked in 1989 to help track down a former customs agent who had gone on the run. She recounted recently on the CBS News program, 48 Hours. She was able to pinpoint the man's location as Lowell, Wyoming, even as U.S. Customs was apprehending him 100 miles west of Wyoming in a town called Lovell. Publicly, the Pentagon continued to deny it was spending money on any kind of psychic research even as reports leaked out in the 1980s of the details of the government's experiments. Finally, in 1995, the CIA released a report conducted by the Independent American Institutes for Research, which acknowledged the U.S. government's long-rumored work with remote viewing for military intelligence purposes. The report also declared Stargate as a failure, arguing that it remains unclear whether the existence of a paranormal phenomena, remote viewing, has been demonstrated. Though the analysts acknowledged that some trials had been successful and that something beyond odd statistical hiccups is taking place, they concluded that any information remote viewing had provided had been too vague and ambiguous and did not produce actionable intelligence. The shutdown of the program that year did not mark the end of the government's interest in psychic phenomena. In 2014, Jacobson writes, The Office of Naval Research launched a four-year program costing some $3.85 million to explore the use of premonition or intuition, what is properly known as a sixth sense or even a spidey sense, in honor of the web-throwing superhero among sailors and marines. And Dr. Edwin May, the former Stargate research head, has continued to argue on behalf of ESP as a legitimate tool for military and domestic intelligence long after the program was shut down. In 2015, Dr. May told Newsweek, that his most recent ESP study, funded by the nonprofit Bile Foundation, is probably the best experiment in the history of the field. Whatever its use is for espionage purposes, the belief in the powers of ESP 
has a long-running history of support among ordinary Americans. According to a 2005 Gallup poll, 73% of Americans at the time believed in some kind of paranormal phenomena, with 41% of those polled saying they believe in ESP specifically. This was an article wrote by History.com. Next, we're going to talk about something a little deeper. In the previously mentioned article from Newsweek, Steps from the Hayward Executive Airport in Northern California, a brunette in jeans and hiking boots scans her surroundings for police. She's carrying a 13-pound canister of liquid nitrogen in her hand. She unclaps the lid and dumps the colorless minus 320 degree liquid into a beer cooler packed with 2,000 tiny aluminum balls. A thick white cloud erupts below the airport's control tower, a witch's brew that crackles and pops. Undetected, she darts back to her SUV and is gone. Over the past two years, the same intruder has performed this clandestine ritual three dozen times across the San Francisco Bay Area. Without warning or permission, she released nitrogen gas clouds in front of a fire station, a busy Catholic church, a water tower, and a government center. She smoke-bombed her way from Palo Alto to Alameda, spewing her cryogenic concoction in popular city parks and near lakes, highways, and Bay Area rapid transport subway lines. She's not a satanic cultist or an incompetent terrorist. Arguably, her mission is even more improbable. It's all part of an experiment run by a former Pentagon scientist to prove the existence of extrasensory perception, known as ESP. 20 years ago this month, the CIA released a report with the unassuming title, quote, An Evaluation of Remote Viewing Research and Applications. The 183-page white paper was more like a white flag. It was the CIA's public admission, after years of speculation, that the U.S. government agencies had been using a type of ESP called remote viewing for more than two decades to help collect military and intelligence secrets. At a cost of about $20 million, the program had employed psychics to visualize hidden extremists that were training in sites in Libya, describe new Soviet submarine designs, and pinpoint the locations of U.S. hostages held by foreign kidnappers. But the report conducted for the CIA by the Independent American Institutes for Research did much more than confirm the existence of this highly classified program. It declared that the psychic spy operation, codenamed Stargate, had been a bust. Yes, the CIA researchers had validated some Stargate trials, finding that hits occur more often than chance, and that something beyond odd statistical hiccups is taking place. But the report declared that ESP was not next to worthless for military use because the tips provided are too vague and ambiguous to produce actionable intelligence. Like a Ouija board, the resulting news headlines seem to write themselves. End of aura for the CIA mystics, the Guardian equipped. Spooks see no future for Pentagon psychics, a Scottish paper reported. Putting the ESP back into espionage, added Businessweek. ABC News Nightline also joined the fray hosting a face-off between Robert Gates, the former CIA director, and Edwin May the scientists who had been running the government's ESP research program. Gates struck first, quote, I don't know of a single instance where it is documented that this kind of activity contributed in any significant way to a policy decision or even to informing policy makers about important information, he states. 
Dr. May fought back, citing, quote, dramatic cases in the laboratory in which Pentagon psychics had accurately sketched a target thousands of miles away that they had never actually seen. But that wasn't good enough, however. Already embarrassed and under pressure for the disclosure that one of their own, Aldrich Ames, had been spying for the Russians for a decade, the CIA officially shut down the psychic spies program. Stargate had fizzled out. It was November 1995, and May was out of a job. His life's work had been discredited by the CIA, and he had been humbled on national television. At age 55, the trained scientist might have retreated to academia or simply just walked away. But instead, he doubled down on ESP. As a boy, Dr. May always seemed to stand out. Born in Boston, the Navy brat moved frequently, finally settling with his family after World War II on a ranch outside of Tucson, Arizona. Quote, I grew up as a Jewish Hungarian cowboy in Arizona, he says while digging into a plate of country ham at a tavern in Virginia. Fascinated with the Russian language, he taught himself the Krillic alphabet. He fell in love with the physics at a local private boarding school and headed to college in New York. Quote, I had a letter, sweater, and calf roping, he says, the only guy at the University of Rochester with that. May graduated in 1962 and began pursuing a doctoral degree. It didn't last long. Quote, I flunked out of my first graduate school, fell in love with a bunch of fast nurses, and learned to play a bagpipe. His timing was unfortunate. The Vietnam War was ramping up, and the U.S. Army came calling. Quote, it was more than a wake-up call. It straightened me out of my life. Dr. May says of nearly getting drafted for the Vietnam War. He enrolled at the University of Pittsburgh and buckled down, earning a Ph.D. in nuclear physics in four years. By 1968, with the counterculture movement raging, May had gone legit, authorizing a thesis that was titled Nuclear Reaction Studies via the Proton-Proton-Neutron Reaction on Light Nuclei and the Proton-Neutron Reaction on Medium to Heavy Nuclei. Dr. May found postdoc work at the University of California, Davis, conducting tests with cyclotrons, but Life outside the physics lab became exerting its own magnetic pull. He says he moved to San Francisco and recalls proudly that he was a professional hippie. In the Bay Area, Dr. May dropped out, attending trippy lectures on parapsychology research and experimenting with drugs. With the standard-issued beard and ponytail in place, he took off for India in search of the miraculous. Dr. May expected to make a Nobel Prize winning discovery of mind over matter, but he came home empty handed. He said he was unable to find a single psychic Weather Street uh, Fakir or Holy Guru who is able or willing to fit into my scientific network. This is what he wrote in a psychic magazine upon his return. In 1975, Dr. May's career found him. A friend recommended him for a job at the prestigious Stanford Research Institute, now called SRI International, in Menlo Park. Dr. May would be conducting psychokinesis experiments, unknown to him at the time. Many of the projects were top secret and funded by the Central Intelligence Agency. Three years earlier, Spooked by the Soviet Union's growing interest in parapsychology, the CIA had embraced ESP. At first, the Cold War era tests were low-key, with CIA officials clumsily hiding objects in a box and asking a psychic to describe the contents. Soon the CIA got serious. They had ordered a $50,000 pilot study at SRI to determine to see if 
Psychics could use the remote viewing skills to visualize and sketch large target sites in and around San Francisco. Harold Puduff, a laser physicist with a PhD from Stanford University, was the program's first director. The CIA, he wrote, was watchful for possible chicanery, participated as remote viewers themselves in order to critique the protocols. The CIA officials drew seven sketches of striking quality, put off recalled and performed well under controlled laboratory conditions. Later, a psychic sitting in California visualized inside a secret National Security Agency listening post in West Virginia, right down to the words on file folders, according to Putoff and a CIA official. The CIA project director described this NSA visualization resulting as a mixed because the psychic nailed the code name for the site and its physical layout, but botched the names of people working at the site. Nonetheless, interest from the United States intelligence community spiked. And when that same remote viewer, provided with only map coordinates and an atlas, described new buildings and a massive construction crane hidden at a secret Soviet nuclear weapons facility, but got most other details wrong, Multiple U.S. agencies began signing up for ESP studies. A few years later, two psychologists at a New Zealand university had a premonition about Mr. Putoff. They called him a bit of a rube. Writing in the journal Nature, the psychologists revealed that they had obtained transcripts of the original CIA experiments. The psychic who had seen deep inside the NSA outposts and the Soviet nuclear site had been fed a large number of cues from the judges over the years, they reported, and it was impossible to duplicate the uncanny results of his ESP testing. Quote, Our own experiments on remote viewing under cue-free conditions have consistently failed to replicate the effect. This is what the psychologists concluded after their experiment was done with. Mr. Putoff, who had famously declared that spoonbender and magician Yuri Geller possessed psychic powers, disputed the psychologist's findings and kept running the ESP program until 1985. Although the CIA stopped funding the ESP research in 77, the Air Force Army and DIA kept writing the checks. The Army's Fort Meade base in Maryland became the program's secret operational home in 1995 when Congress directed the CIA to evaluate remote viewing and either take over the program or cancel it for good. The DIA was at the helm. Congress bankrolled and protected the program for many years. Well-known defenders included Rhode Island Senator Claiborne Pell, and North Carolina Representative Charlie Rose, who once told an interviewer that, quote, if the Russians have remote viewing and we don't, we are in trouble. A lesser-known supporter, Maine Senator William Cohen, who would later become the Secretary of Defense under President Bill Clinton, said, I was impressed with the concept of remote viewing, as he speaks to Newsweek in an email. The results may not have been consistent enough to, con to constitute actionable intelligence, but exploration of the power of the mind was and remains an important endeavor. To Dr. May, that's an understatement. To his admirers, Dr. May is a legitimate parapsychologist. To his critics, that phrase is the ultimate oxymoron. From 1985 to 1995, Dr. May served as the California-based research director of the Pentagon's ESP program, a proton probing scientist by training and a paranormal prophet by choosing. Dr. May was that rare specimen, a full-time ESP researcher with a salary and 401k plan courtesy of the United States government. 
Thick of waist now, with a shiny pate and white beard, he could pass for an aging folk star, Peter Yarrow. Dr. May has never met a joke that he didn't like. Conversations come loaded with amusing chestnuts, like, we'd answer the phone as, hello, Division of Parapsychology, may we tell you who's calling? Washington Gossip. You know, the energy department is run by morons and TMI. I hung out with the Wicca community for a while. But when the talks turn to non-believers who dismiss remote viewing as voodoo without examining the evidence, Dr. May is short-tempered. Quote, I'm not going to deal with a skeptic who has no freaking idea about what he's talking about because he's just making it up. That's bad scientists, and I am a scientist. And Dr. May has even less time for all the former Stargate psychics who pedal mood ring junk science online, some warning paying customers about flying saucers and the coming apocalypse. Quote, they are ripping people off and I have to undo that when I try to sell this to the mainstream scientists. So what is his scientific evidence? In 1995, when the CIA began preparing its program review, Dr. May provided the review team with results of 10 experiments he felt provided the strongest evidence to support the remote viewing phenomena. The test, with names like AC Lucid Dream Pilot and ERD EEG Investigation, Detailed the success rate of each experiment. One of the CIA remote viewers, while clearly in the minority, was sold. It's clear to this author that ESP is possible and has been demonstrated, she wrote in the agency's report. This conclusion is not based on belief, but rather on commonly accepted scientific criteria. Today, Dr. May says ESP has already been proved and defends it like an impatient school teacher explaining gravity. He quickly offers a barrage of evidence and anecdotes to make his case. In a recent interview, Dr. May references an obscure presentation that the military's own remote viewing project manager wrote in 1984 for his Army superiors. According to the now declassified secret briefing that's available online, the Army's Intelligence and Security Command had conducted 100 collection projects using ESP since 1979 for a slew of government agencies including the CIA, NSA, FBI, and the Secret Service. Several of the projects involved the use of Army psychics to help locate Americans taken by hostage in 1979 in Iran. Quote, Over 85% of our operational missions have produced accurate target information in the briefing. Even more significant, approximately 50% of the 760 missions produced usable intelligence. Dr. May sees the Army report as confirmation that Gates was protecting the CIA when he declared on Nightline that remote viewing had never contributed in any significant way to the United States intelligence efforts. Gates lied, he tells Newsweek. What more can I say? Gates, now a partner in the Rice Hadley Gates consulting firm, would not comment. But the author of the Army's 1984 report did. Brian Busby was an Army lieutenant colonel when he briefly ran the Pentagon's ESP program in the 1980s. He's retired in Alabama now and has never spoken to the media before. He stands by his remote viewing report, quote, I believed in it then, and I believe in it now. It was a real thing, and it worked. Busby says the program was just one low-cost tool that provided an additional source of intel for military and civilian analysts to, to weigh in on. When he learned that the CIA had shut down the program, he stated, I was disappointed that somebody wouldn't pick up the banner. For Dr. May, further proof of the, of the program's many wonders in Stargate's legendary, quote, Agent 001. 
the first psychic to work directly for the Pentagon, then Army Chief Warrant Officer Joseph McMongol, began remote viewing for the government in 1978. As a child, McMongol recalls sharing thoughts telepathically with his twin sister and says he honed his ESP abilities as a soldier avoiding deadly attacks in Vietnam. Dr. May says McMongol could correctly identify a target just under 50%, and that's just under 50% of the time when presented with five possible options. Using chance alone, he says, the best outcome would be just 20%. Dr. May cites one intriguing example. It was 1979. And the National Security Council wanted help in seeing inside an unidentified industrial building near the Arctic Circle in Russia. McMongol began imagining himself drifting down into the building, and he had an overwhelming sense that he could see a submarine, a really big one with twin holes. He made detailed drawings of the giant sub for the NSC. Only later, McMogul wrote in his 2002 memoir, Did U.S. satellite photographs confirm the existence at the Soviet's secret Zverdovskink shipyard of a massive double-hulled typhoon submarine, which constituted a new threat to the American national security? Upon retirement of the Army in 1984, McMongol was awarded with the Legion of Merit. Given for exceptionally meritorious conduct, his award states that he served in a unique intelligence project that is revolutionizing the intelligence community. It adds that he produced critical intelligence unavailable from any other source for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, DIA, NSA, CIA, and Secret Service. For years after the government shut down its ESP program, Dr. May and McMongol tried to bring it back from the dead. They approached friendlies inside the United States agencies that had once funded them, and they fled from us like you wouldn't believe, says Dr. May. He was getting desperate and out of money, and then he met a millionaire. The third generation owner of a pharmaceutical empire, Luis Portela, was in a unique position to help. And in 1924, Portela's grandfather opened a modest laboratory above the pharmacy where he worked in Porto, Portugal. Today, that business is called Bio, and it is the largest pharmaceutical manufacturer in Portugal. Its products are sold in more than 50 countries on four continents. From an early age, Portela has been spellbound by the paranormal. In an email, he says he's always tried to understand why humanity and religion accepted too easily some phenomena, so-called mysteries or miracles, while scientists denied those phenomena, claiming that they did not exist. So in 1994, Patella set up a non-profit Bile Foundation to study ESP and the human being from both the physical and spiritual perspectives. It's a radical concept for such a conservative industry. Imagine Johnson & Johnson financing crystal healing. The Bile Foundation has funded more than 500 projects in 25 countries, including dozens of ESP studies and even research into ghost sightings and belief in UFOs. Dr. May has been a frequent bio recipient, collecting about $400,000 in research funds for nine ESP-related projects. In the process, Portella has become a fanboy, believing the controversy scientist has helped foster the understanding of the human being. Funded by the Bile Foundation at a cost of $45,000, May's latest ESP study is probably the best experiment in the history of the field, the Stargate researcher reports. The goal, to test whether changes of thermodynamic entropy at a remote natural site enhance the quality of the anomalous cognition. 
That's a $2 way of asking whether a sudden release of thermal energy, like a rocket launch or a liquid nitrogen eruption in a beer cooler, can improve a psychic's ability to perceive what's happening at the site from thousands of miles away. Quote, This wasn't something that we just pulled out of our rear ends. It was really all the spying stuff we did for the government, where we discovered that when targets involve large changes of thermodynamic entropy, like underground nukes, accelerators, electromagnetic pulse devices, and so on, they work much better in signaling the remote viewers. To conduct the ESP improvement experiment, Dr. May reassembled his old A-team. Out of a rural Virginia, there's McMongle, the former Army intelligence officer who won the Legion of Merit. Then there's Nevin Lance, a former Stargate researcher who works today as a Palo Alto psychotherapist and an authentic happiness coach. And finally, there's Angela Delaforia Ford, a former Stargate psychic and DIA intelligence analyst from Maryland who markets herself as a medium that can help people connect with their spirit guides as well as communicate with their loved ones on the other side. Ford was one of the only half dozen women who worked as psychics for the government's program. Some of her military colleagues derided her because three spirit guides would possess her mind during Stargate remote viewing sessions and guide her observations. One was a fat cherub, another a boy-like angel, and the last a 17th century British professor who spoke through her. Ford says. In an interview, she also says she once saw a UFO outside her suburban home in 2010. Quote, it reminded me of something like they call the mothership. It was not moving, it was hovering, and then it just sort of disappeared. Regardless of her unorthodox methods and beliefs, Ms. Ford also has her admirers. One of them is Senator Cohen, the former Senator and Secretary of Defense. He first got to know Ford whenever he was on the Senate Select Intelligence Committee, which helped fund the Stargate, even when the Defense Department lost all of its interest. Ford conducted psychic readings for Cohen when he was a Senator, and he remains a true believer. Quote, I did support the Stargate program, as did Senator Robert Byrd and other members of the committee, Cohen says in an email. There seemed to be a small segment of people who were able to key in to a different level of consciousness. Angela Ford was one of them. It doesn't mean that she has, or any of the others in the Stargate program, possessed psychic powers that could predict the future or peer into the past and retrieve lost information, but there were a number of remote viewing tests conducted that I found very impressive. With Ms. Ford, Lance, and McMongle back on the job, Dr. May began work on his ESP 2.0 experiment. The first step was to design protocols and choose 22 distinct Bay Area outdoor locations near his private cognitive sciences laboratory in Palo Alto. Sites included the Hayward Executive Airport, a BART overpass in Union City, the Palo Alto Duck Pond, and the Polgus Ridge Preserve in Redwood City. Next, Dr. May would fire up his Sony Vio laptop and ask the computer to randomly select one of the target sites. Dr. May and the remote viewers would not know the result. The computer would also generate a text message to inform May's assistant, the mysterious brunette, a former waitress named Lori Holly who was to drive, and whether she would create a mini-liquid nitrogen eruption. Again, Dr. May and the psychics were not told of this result. Dr. May worked with the psychics, one at a time, in a quiet room. He placed a blindfold over each psychic's eyes and then said, quote, Please access and describe the first thing you see when we remove the blindfold. In a half hour or so, after getting into a relaxed or trance-like state, 
The remote viewer then described exactly what he or she saw at the Bay Area location. Dr. May then entered the psychic's descriptions into his laptop, assigning a number value for each water feature, man-made structure, and other physical element that was described. Finally, the computer determined the accuracy of each remote viewing session. For these tests in California, Dr. May drove the psychics to the site where the computer had selected and then told them to remove their blindfolds. But many other times, Dr. May conducted the experiment using locations thousands of miles away in Maryland or Virginia, in hotel rooms, or McMongol's Den. In those cases, Dr. May held up a photo of the correct target site for the psychic to see once they had described their vision. The old Stargate Psychics recently completed 72 independent trials with Dr. May's assistant pouring liquid nitrogen 36 times. In his first report to Bile, Dr. May declared a victory, finding, quote, a significant effect supporting the study hypothesis. Liquid nitrogen works. The sudden release of energy acts as a flare in the dark and may believes helping psychics to see across the country and even into the future. Quote, I think it's very important. As he says this to the unpublished study, if it holds up, it will be a breakthrough. Chances are, Ray Hyman won't see it that way. A professor emeritus of psychology at the University of Oregon, Dr. Hyman is one of the nation's leading skeptics about the paranormal. Along with his friends James Randi, a.k.a. The Amazing Randi, He's a founding member of the Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, now known as the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, whose mission is to promote the, quote, use of reason in examining controversial and extraordinary claims. As a scientist and a former magician and mentalist, he's a living embodiment of the you can't bullshit a bullshitter maxim. Hyman and his skeptic Ken are deeply suspicious of parapsychology and other phenomena that they can't prove, including a man's ability to walk through walls, become invisible, stop animal hearts through intense staring, or the other wacky ideas embraced by Pentagon officials in the 1970s and 80s and lampooned in the book and the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats. Dr. Hyman and Dr. May first met at the SRI in the 1970s, and originally, the skeptic was encouraged. Sent by the Defense Department's Advanced Research Projects Agency to the Institute to Observe Illusionist Geller, just a charming con artist, Hyman grew to respect May's scientific rigor and his ethics. They agreed that the early SRI research was crap. Hyman says, providing way too many clues to the psychics and fudging the results. But when Dr. May began running the ESP program, Dr. Hyman says he also created protocol problems. May became the only arbiter of whether a psychic had accurately described a target. Quote, the only judge who could make it work was Ed May, Hyman says, and that's a no-no. So in 1995, when the CIA selected Dr. Hyman to help evaluate the Stargate program, the automatic writing was on the wall. Although the famous debunker was paired with a known ESP proponent, Dr. Hyman's views still prevailed. The CIA's final report chastised Dr. May for serving as both judge and jury on virtually all the ESP tests. Quote, the use of the same judge across experiments further compounds the problem of non-independence of the experiments, the report concluded. Research recently at his Oregon home, Hyman expresses a begrudging respect for his old adversary. Quote, he's a smart guy, no question about it. He's talented, says the doctor. The 87-year-old professor says that well-meaning researchers like Dr. May are trying to bring respect to a field burdened by strip mall palm readers. 1-800-PSYCHICS and Stargate alums on the internet who now charge top dollar to purportedly 
Gain the Stock Market, Discover the Lost City of Atlantis, and Uncover the Truth Behind the Kennedy Assassination. Yet Hyman believes even the most sincere and sophisticated efforts to prove the existence of ESP have all failed. Quote, Having the window dressings of statistics and controls, double blind, all that kind of stuff, doesn't make it science. A few months ago at McMongle's home near Charlottesville, Virginia, May volunteers to conduct a live remote viewing test for me with Ace Psychic at his side. Quote, Joe, please access and describe a photograph you will see in about one or two minutes from now, says May. McMongle sits still for 30 seconds and then begins sketching on a pad. From the comfort of his own brown recliner, McMongle describes his drawing. Quote, these squares are representatives of buildings, and these buildings are kind of just scattered through here, so they're like embedded in a hillside. The roads are not very good roads, they're more like paths. May ask for more. Float up in the air a thousand feet. It's safe. Roll around 360 degrees and tell me what the gestalt of the area is like, says May. Okay, you've got a large body of water. This is probably an island of some kind. Mountains up here because the river goes up into the mountains. You've got a couple of bridges. This is a small village, adds McMongle. Then May's laptop randomly selects two photographs and labels them as targets A and B. May flips a coin. It comes up as heads, which my teenage daughter had secretly described beforehand would represent Target A. Dr. May pulls out the Target A photograph for the big reveal, and it's a close-up of a giant waterfall. There isn't a building, path, island, mountain, bridge, or village in sight. Both men laugh. The test has been a failure. I've never gotten a waterfall in my life, says McMongle. But May suggests some alternative theories that there's a concept in statistics called non-stationary. What that means is the phenomenon comes and goes in unpredictable ways. He adds that intention, attention, and expectation always affects the remote viewing, and that we violated virtually all three things in this particular trial. Then Ed May pauses and offers his final explanation. It was all just a demo. That is the story from Newsweek with the conversation that they had with the famous Dr. Ed May over parapsychology and his studies that he did independently for the U.S. government. We're going to get into a few more definitions now just to give you a, a graceful introduction into what all this stuff is with the mind reading, with the uh, remote viewing, the men who stare at goats the CIA, DIA, DOD, and all their uses of these supposed psychics. Now, I will say from my own personal standpoint, do I believe that the phenomena exist? Do I believe that it's real? And do I think that it actually has good uses? Well, I do believe the phenomena exists. However, I do not recommend anyone dabble in it. Um, could it be used for good? Sure. You know, I mean, the, the atom bomb, when it was dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, was used for good. So, really, that's all in the perception of the beholder. However, as a Christian, I have to say that if you dabble in these types of things, in my personal opinion, now, once again, I'm not an expert in any of this, but in my personal opinion, based off of, you know, hours upon hours of studies of these different types of events and scenarios and capabilities that people claim that they have. And I, I think I am right now at probably close to 90 pages of notes just on this one podcast. I would say that this ability is real. The availability and means of reconstructing some of these tests 
and trying to get a 50% approval rate on these tests is rare. Uh, there may be people out there with psychic abilities. Uh, however, I do question what that word psychic means. Uh, you know, with the way these things are taught, the psychic mediums and talking to the dead, uh, having your spirit guides, to me, that is dabbling into things that the Holy Bible tells us not to dabble into. I do see why various countries and why various militaries would want to get this type of a, how would you say, uh, capability perfected. You know, I mean, militarily speaking, if I had the ability to see the nuclear launch codes of the president, and then I could control the minds of the men that were sitting in an intercontinental ballistic missile, um, you know, compound, and I could remote control their minds from my chair sitting here in, in you know, Northwest Texas. If I had the ability to steal the codes and launch the missile and hit wherever I wanted, I would probably be the most dangerous man on earth. However, I will say this, if such a man or woman with such capabilities did exist, it's never been used to that effect, and I think, honestly, it would have been used already by one of these countries. Certainly the United States, if we had the capability of doing such an act, uh, I could very, very easily see the next time Kim Jong-un decides to launch one of his nuclear ballistic missiles, uh, if we could you know, mind control one of his uh, scientists to blow it up on the launching pad, killing himself, uh, why wouldn't we do that, right? You know, there are more devious things that you can do. Assassinations, obviously, we've gone over that with the CIA, uh, more than frequently experimenting with how to torture someone to the extent that they fracture their mind, they don't know who they are, you can then program the various fractures into different states of peril, uh, different states of culpability, and actually induce, without even the act of self-awareness, one person to commit an assassination and then have just complete anomalous... Um, vagueness about it you know they, they would have complete amnesia they wouldn't even know what they did so i'm with with research like this it does uh it does make me you know laugh and smile every now and then when i read some of this stuff because i believe a lot of it is uh bs i believe a lot of people are very good bs artists but i also do believe that occasionally you can get somebody with extra sensory capabilities who can perform tasks that we just can't explain. And I'm okay with saying that. That doesn't make me not a Christian in, in admitting that some people have capabilities. Some people have the uh, capability of chance on their side or luck on their side, right? You have some people who just know that something is going to happen. And they are fairly accurate with their descriptions of a future event that will happen. You know, uh, many people may date back to Nostradamus and his abilities to predict the future. But don't forget that Nostradamus uh, went very heavily in the occult with scrying, uh, with trying to get spirit guides and, you know, looking into the the mirror reflection of, a, of water, and then asking for spirits to help him see the future and, you know, all different types of crap. Uh, and some of the vagueness that is within his descriptions, like the event with 9-11 and the two towers falling, you know, that's probably one of the things where people go, wow, you know, maybe there really is something to parapsychology. But I would also say maybe there really is something to demonology. You know, uh, the Nazis, 
there's a few different famous Nazis within the SS who admitted to talking to beings that were not of this reality, not of this plane, and getting technical information that they used to help build their wonder weapons. And, you know, Nikola Tesla, same guy. He, he had... Um, he had a spirit guide, which I think he, before he died, actually declared it to be a demon. Uh, this is a, actually a very common theme. And, you know, with this type of common theme, with demons or with some sort of a spirit that you're not supposed to be messing with, guys, uh, giving you information that's unknown, you, you build a pathway from yourself to the entity, into the void that the entities are located. And if you, you know, harness that path good enough, you become nothing more than a vessel for these spirits to um, incapacitate at times, um, to take control of, um, and, you know, like the this one lady, Miss Ford, she had three different spirit guides that would come in and uh, speak through her. Okay, in my mindset, the way I view that is that those are demonic spirits that are doing that, or evil spirits. Call them what you want. Don't ever think that the government would not use stuff like that. Obviously, they have. They probably still are. Um, obviously, Congress has even funded this before. Uh the reason why I, I went through such a long explanation of all of this is because over the next period of days, we're going to get deeper into the various different CIA operations that were involving with Stargate Project and with a couple other things. And, you know, give you a little bit more of an explanation of the psychics and the mediums and the actual terminologies that they used. Uh, many of you have probably seen stuff like this in movies. You've probably heard of the conspiracy theories and the secret government files that talk about stuff like this. Well, here they are, if you've never heard them before in detail. If you did enjoy this so far, if you are uh, encouraged by this new series that I'm going through, please email me at uh, AmericanVindictaShow at gmail.com. Tell me what it is that you liked about it, what you're interested in. Uh, is there anything else that you know you would like for me to add on or to look into? Um, there's a lot within this topic of parapsychology and psychokinesis. Uh, once again, I do find it to be fascinating, but you know, I, I think it's 50 50. I think 50% of the people know that they're lying, and then 50% of the people are dabbling in things that they're not supposed to be able to do. That's my personal opinion. Uh, so, you know. I don't know. I, I, once again, I look, I look into things like this and, you know, what is it that we're working on now? You know, it, these are things that are now declassified. Uh, the Nazis back in the thirties and twenties were working with this, but honestly, the occultism really started back in, uh, about the mid 1800s, late 1800s, you know, I mean, with the, the seances, the mind reading, the palm reading, uh, the spirit guides talking to loved ones who have passed on. You know, these are things that have even taken place uh, over a dozen times or more within the White House located in Washington, D.C. So, you know, this is a prolific use of this capability, uh, I guess you would say. And it's, once again, I think it's still around. I don't think it ever died off. Uh, I, I firmly believe that once the government finds a couple people that can do something that no one else can, they will fund it in black budget funds and you will never hear of it ever, ever again. They'll be in a black site somewhere doing things that no one else will know, no one will write about, and uh, they will be lost to the annals of history. However, the government will weaponize anything anyone in order to protect themselves, to protect the country, to thwart uh, any type of foreign invasion or attack or, you know, cause them. So that is the, uh, that is the predicament that we deal with. Uh, the next show, which will be the Friday show, 
we're going to go into a little bit more in-depth detail. Uh, we're going to get into, once again, some of the other events that have happened with this. Uh, if you'd like to support the show, you can go to AmericanVindictiveShow.com. There is a donations page on there. If you want any active shooter training, we do have the latest updates for the active shooter training. You can find it actually there on the show website. Um, for the October event, late October, uh, that's going to be held at the Calico Buffalo uh, Base Camp, which is Jamie Walden's base camp. Um, that is going to be more or less a uh, all-inclusive camp. There'll there'll be cabins to rent. Uh, there'll be campgrounds, an amphitheater. Uh, there'll be a, a, a wash house, so you don't have to you know do baby wipe baths or wash yourself with a garden hose. Um, and it's it's going to be a fun event. You know we're going to be sitting around the fires. Jamie will be doing some preaching. We'll be doing some teaching. And uh, I think it's something for a three-day event, 12 hours a day for $200 a day, you know, totaling $600 plus $50 to be able to help pay for the utilities. I mean, you're not going to get that type of training anywhere else. You're really not. And the active shooter training that we do is scenario-based. Uh, there'll be no firearms needed, so anyone who needs to travel, you won't have to be checking anything with TSA. You know, the most you'll need to do is bring some... Uh, Protection for your hands, so gloves with padding, and maybe some, uh, you know, a thick shirt, or uh, maybe even a light jacket. A lot of the guys at the last training eventually just took everything off. The, you know, the little pellet sting, but it's good to have that feedback that you were shot and to know that you need to work on your tactics a little bit, which is something that we are going to be teaching tremendously. Is tactics. We're not training militias. We're not talking about January six. We're not getting into any of that type of crap, okay? That's how you get shut down. What we are strictly going over is your availability with your own means to protect yourself, to protect people that are in the public in the event of an active shooter, a terrorist event, an active stabbing, or what we would just call an active killing, or anything that's happening from your own home with break-ins, home invasions, kidnappings. We're going to be going over quite a bit. There will also be a lot of uh, attention to um, medical training, which is one thing that you know I can go ahead and tell you right now, 99% of you do not have enough medical training. And uh, even just some of the most basic wounds can kill. And we're going to be teaching people the type of instruments and medical devices that we use. A lot of hands-on. Everything is hands-on, guys. Let's just submit it. Every single bit of this is going to be hands-on, one-on-one instruction between myself and Jamie and, and uh, one of the other instructors if he can make it. It's going to be a great time. So if you need that information, American Vindictive Show, the tab will say Active Shooter. Click on that. If you want to know more information, please email me at AmericanVindictiveShow at gmail.com. And uh, you can also email Jamie. And uh, for the payment for this next training event in October, that's at Jamie's uh, base camp, we'll be accepting the payment when you get there, when you arrive. So don't worry about trying to do anything else there. But if you do want to uh, come, Please go ahead and send us the information so that we can go ahead and put you down on the roster. All right. That's all I got. Enjoy your day. Tomorrow's going to be a new show, and we're going to get into some deep, wild stuff about the government's use of psychics, the remote viewing, and maybe some other paranormal stuff. See you next time. Stay frosty.